Burke and Wills, Roland Harvey. Roland Harvey is the illustrator of a number of award-winning children's books, including My Place in Space, The Friends of Emily Culpepper, and Burke and Wills, and is the creator of the Roland Harvey Drawing Book, in which he shares his drawing tips and techniques with children. The detail and whimsical style of Roland's illustrations make Australian history come alive for children today. In 1860, a costly expedition set out from Melbourne across the inhospitable plains of Australia to the Gulf of Carpentaria. Robert O'Hara Burke was chosen to lead the expedition. William John Wills became his second in command. But the expedition was plagued with disasters, from the choice of Burke as leader to the tragedy of missing the support party at Cooper's Creek by just nine hours. Burke and Wills, Roland Harvey In 1860, Abraham Lincoln was elected 16th American President. The first game of baseball had just been played. Cowboys and Indians were alive and well out west, and in that year the Civil War broke out between the American states. The horse tram had just been invented. In Egypt, work had begun on the Suez Canal. Dr David Livingstone was in Africa exploring the Zambezi River, and in England, Charles Dickens was about to write Great Expectations. Australia in 1860 had developed from a desperate and struggling penal colony to a rip-roaring, booming land of opportunity, made wealthy first by wool and then gold. In that year, the Victorian government offered a big prize for the first expedition to cross the continent from south to north. The expedition was important for two reasons, to explore the inland of Australia and to discover an overland route for the telegraph line. There was great rivalry between Victoria and South Australia for the honour of sponsoring the successful expedition. John MacDill Stewart represented South Australia and the Royal Society of Victoria chose Robert O'Hara Burke to lead their party. The Royal Society's expedition was the most lavishly equipped and costly ever seen in Australia. Burke, a former soldier and policeman, was charming, arrogant, brave but impatient and hot-tempered. He had no experience as an explorer or bushman and was to prove to be a disastrous choice. George James Landells had brought 25 camels from India for the expedition and was made Burke's second in command. William John Wills, another member of the party, was a young surveyor, meteorologist and astronomer. Wills had the characteristics that would have made him an ideal leader. Establishing the expedition cost £15,500 a very large amount of money in those days. Apart from the 25 imported camels, there were 22 horses, 18 men and 21 tons of stores, all the ingredients needed for a successful journey. Leaving his rival Stuart to be underway, Burke cut short the final preparations and hurried out of Melbourne on the 20th of August 1860. The impressive cavalcade received a grand send-off. Before they had even left the settled country, their troubles had begun. Burke and second officer Landells argued over Burke's decision to abandon the 60 gallons of rum which they carried to keep the camels from, free from scurvy. When they reached Menindee on the Darling River, the quarrelsome Burke replaced Landells with Wills and employed two new men, Charles Gray and William Wright. Wright was appointed third officer. He knew the way north to the waterholes. Burke, Wills and six other men left Menindee to journey to Cooper's Creek, leaving behind the main party to wait for the Royal Society to confirm the appointment of the new man, Wright. Burke's party reached Cooper's Creek and waited in vain for Wright's arrival. Impatient to continue, Burke left William Bray in charge of the depot and headed off with only three men, Wills, Gray and a young soldier named John King, to race for the northern coast. By leaving before Wright's arrival, Burke never received the message that could have changed the outcome of the trip. His rival Stuart had been forced to turn back, so there was no longer any need to hurry, and certainly no need to take risks. In his impatience to reach the northern coast of Australia, Burke refused to allow time for scientific observations to be made, having earlier forbidden the expedition scientist Dr Becker to stop to make notes and sketches, he set off on the last leg, over entirely new country leaving behind his botanist, his naturalist, 
and his medical officer, and not one of the party was an experienced bushman. Meanwhile, the main party led by Wright had been making its way to Cooper's Creek. Having only reached the Bulu River, the party was forced to stop. Three men had died from scurvy, and the others were sick. Incredible though it sounds, the party's medical officer, Dr. Becker, would not send the sick men back to Menindi, nor would he allow the party to travel to, on to Cooper's Creek. Amazingly, he did not use the dried vegetables that they had carried to prevent scurvy, saying that they did not have time to prepare them as they required dissolving or being kept in water for a long time. So Wright's abundantly supplied party sat idly beside the Bulu River. Burke was lucky, for recent rains had brought green grass and plenty of water to the northern country and the walk to the gulf, though boggy in parts, was not difficult. At last, on 11th of January 1861, they noted that the water in the creeks was tidal, and although the mud and mangroves prevented them from seeing the waters of the gulf, they knew they had reached their goal. Having told Bray to wait only three months at Cooper's Creek, Burke was anxious to return. After only one day's rest, and although supplies were low, Burke set out on the return journey, refusing even time to shoot some of the wildfowl that was teeming in the area. The return journey was a nightmare. Although the party was exhausted, Burke marched them day and night. Gray was the first to fall ill and beg for rest, but Burke ignored his weakness and pressed on, not even stopping to gather food. If Burke had either stopped to renew their food supplies, or taken the return journey at a slower pace, the four men may have stayed healthy and fit all the way back to Cooper's Creek. For five weeks the explorers walked on. It was not until all their food was gone that Burke finally stopped long enough to kill a camel. It appears that they left most of the meat behind, for ten days later they had to shoot Burke's horse and cut it up to dry for food. Things were indeed becoming grim. A week later, on 17th April, the wretched Grey died of scurvy and after taking a whole precious day to bury him, Burke, Wills and King slowly set off again. When three days later the three men staggered into the depot at Cooper's Creek, the shock of what they found must have been almost too much to bear. The camp was deserted. Bray and the support party, after waiting four months, left that morning just nine hours before. Bray had buried a small store of food at the foot of the tree marked Dig. With it was a note that made Burke believe that Bray's party was fit and healthy, and therefore the starving men would have no chance of catching them. Against the wishes of King and Wills, Burke insisted that they try to make their way 150 miles to Mount Hopeless, where there was a police outpost. While the exhausted men struggled downstream, a terrible thing was happening at Cooper's Creek. Bray and Wright, anxious about the four men, returned to Cooper's Creek. They did not notice a billy left by King, nor did they dig up the stores and find a note left by Burke. The three campfires were thought to have been left by Aborigines, so Burke and Will's last chance of survival disappeared as Bray and Wright rode away to rejoin their party. They had stayed only fifteen minutes. Having missed being rescued by nine hours, and then again by just thirty miles, the three explorers were left to wander up and down the creek, desperately trying to find food. The natives looked after these miserable men, bringing them fish, seed cake and occasionally birds, but it is reported that Burke drove them away, firing shots over their heads. The three were very weak now, and what food they could find was not enough. On 26th of June 1861, the brave William John Wills insisted that the others press on, leaving him in the shade of some branches where he knew he would soon die. A few days later, Burke was too weak to move. King nobly stayed with him until early one morning Burke died, leaving King quite alone. The Aborigines took pity on this starving white man. They fed and sheltered John King for three months until help finally came. King was rescued by Alfred William Howitt, who had been sent with a search party from Melbourne, where it had been guessed that Burke's expedition was in trouble. In pitiful condition, King survived the slow trip back to Melbourne. His health slowly improved and he lived on for some years. In some ways, the tragic expedition was not a waste of time. 
it had completed the picture of inland Australia and proved that there was no inland sea. More importantly, each of the rescue parties sent from different parts of the continent added in some way to the understanding of the land it crossed. Bushman William Landsborough came southwest from the Gulf of Carpentaria and discovered the Barclay Tablelands. Ex-policeman Frederick Walker came overland from Rockhampton and found camel tracks near the Gulf, proving at least that Burke had travelled that far. Adelaide squatter John McKinlay followed Gregory's track along Strislecki's Creek to Cooper's Creek and on. His report on the nature of the country was to help disprove the theory that the inland of Australia was a useless desert and did have a future as a grazing country. The pathway for the pioneers had been marked out. Not long after, the busy pasture industry that exists today began to develop in northern Australia.